Last class, we were discussing how cultural diffusion and word of mouth work within friend groups. You've got these different categories, uh, the opinion leaders, early adopters, and market mavens. It's also important to remember that when we consume popular culture, popular culture is a collective process. Just like our definition of culture, you don't live in a vacuum, right? So when you're consuming culture, you're part of something else. And sometimes that is through focused gatherings where uh, Grazian says, there are, quote, co-present participants that are entertained on a shared objective, i.e. winning the game, as well as each other. This is, in the sense, these focus gatherings are things like classic party games, video games, even virtual video games. We take part in them with other people. I'm always amazed, um, you know, we have a million kind of board games and different games like that in, in my house and it's we don't take them out all that often but then when we go buy a new one like I love Cards Against Humanity I think that is one of the greatest games ever and but if you go to Target and you go into the game section man the games just keep exploding even further right because at the end of the day People do like to sit down with each other and engage in different forms of games. This is like a basic thing of um, what it means to be human. People, early people, uh, develop games, you know, right around the time humans became humans. Um, I'll leave that to my anthropological, anthropology co colleagues to explain a little better, but Games have been around for a very long time. Fun story. I play, I end up, me and my wife end up playing uh, Cards Against the Humanity with my parents a lot, oh my which is always funny. But to give you an idea, the first time I took my wife to home to meet my parents, they were like, we got this great movie we want to watch. Mind you, this is the first time they've met her, or she's met them. The movie was Human Centipede. Oh, no. Oh, no. And they didn't really know what it was about. I didn't, it had just come out, and they were like, yeah, we've got the DVD. I mean, this was back before Street, and this was like 2009. So yes, the first time my wife, who married, you know, has been with me ever since, met my parents, we bonded around human centipede. She did not run out the door. And later on, we were playing a card game, and my mom was like, whoever gave me that card was a scummy person. And it was my wife that did it. It, it was a great first meeting um, of my parents, but it worked out. So now nothing phases us, right? Like, oh, you want to play Cards Against Humanity? Let's go for it. How many of you have played Cards Against Humanity, right? Apples to apples? Not, not really, you know. Okay. I have, like, family against humanity. Like, they make them for smaller kids, right? And it's all about, like, farting and stuff. It's whatever. My son's actually a lot more fun to play with because he thinks the ones that I pick are hilarious. So I always win when I'm playing his version. Um, I tend to always go with the most twisted one that comes in. Like, yeah, that's the one. And that's what I also give out. And then, like, my wife's not going to pick the things that I pick. The other way we collectively consume things is part of a subculture. And we discussed a little bit about subcultures. Um, but a subculture is, quote, a social world that stands apart from the larger society in some distinctively patterned way. 
often because its members invest in alternative identities and systems of belief and practice. There's a whole area in cultural studies that's considered subcultural analysis, okay? And what I'm discussing here is actually from Doing Cultural Studies, the book on the Walkman. It's not in your book. Um, and what subcultural analysis does is it emphasizes the way that subcultures use commodities as signifiers in an active process of constructing oppositional identities. Um, this stems from a, a Birmingham School of Cultural Studies theorist by the name of Dick Hebdige. And Dick Hebdige went out and studied punks. And I, I talked a little bit about this with you a couple weeks ago. But what he did was he tried to understand what these different symbols that punks use, what they mean, where they come from. He follows the history back to um, like teddies, which are people who would ride around on mopeds on with suits and this was intimidating at that time in the United Kingdom. I find it really funny. I think I've mentioned that before. Um, but the idea here is that consumption is not passive and there are what are known as polysemic qualities of commodities. And what's for something to be polysemic what that means is that the thing has multiple meanings in one commodity. So what does um, a mohawk mean? Well, according to Dick Hebdige, it came out of um, the same kind of ideas produced by Rastafarians about having dreads and, and creating an Afrocentric um, appearance as opposed to what they called bald heads which was having a European style cut hair um, so the punks kind of created almost like a lion's mane with a uh, what's it called a mohawk right as an oppositional form of having hair and I'm a complete bald head, not by choice. I'd have a big old head of hair if I could. But then it only looked good when I was buzzing my hair because I was going so bald. Now I'm so bald that even that, when I forget to buzz my hair periodically, it really starts looking bad. So then I decided, well, I better just shave it all off because... It looks ridiculous and I can't keep up with it. Um, so what happens is people actually use cultural symbols as forms of resistance. Um, so these theorists say that consumption of commodities by subcultures is resistant to the dominant culture. But at the end of the day, what you end up with is co-optation. And you can think back to a couple weeks ago uh, I showed that slide I talked to you about someone that was dressed up for Halloween as a punk but for her a punk was Avril Lavigne which couldn't be further from punk to me um, so you end up with kind of this bricolage of really rock identities, but you see a lot of people that are from punk to metal, right? And the different identities and the way that um, gets picked up by the mainstream and um, quite often whitewashed, right? Especially with African American culture. Um, you see this again and again, uh, but subcultures are really the source of where style comes from. And that's Dick Hebdige's whole point. That style emerges at the point when you have groups that are um, 
marginalized and subordinated, they start to create things as ways to resist. But eventually it gets co-opted and instead of being an oppositional code, it becomes a dominant code. And think back to that with encoding, decoding, right? And the explanation I gave to you about modern family. What does it mean when the things that we think are resistant to the dominant order become appendages of the dominant order? And part of this, part of what this strain of cultural studies argues is there's potential for that resistance to grow. But when we think of theorists like Antonio Gramsci, who I told you about, and his theory of hegemony, too often it just becomes subsumed back into the machine. So we see these oppositional codes develop, and after a while, they just become the functioning of power. We can also think about scenes. And there's a huge part of the sociology of culture that's interested in studying scenes. And a scene is, quote, the actual places where subcultural participants experience their shared identity through social interaction. Those can happen locally, you got local scenes, which are specific places that gain their own culture. You get translocal scenes. These are, quote, places that circulate fashions and lifestyles in patterns of cross-national cross diffusion. K-pop would be a great example of this. So would Bollywood, right? These things that have kind of a local identity to them that develop out of transnational networks, ideas about um, how things are different from the very locality that they develop, and then different populations of people around the world also grab them and create culture from them. And finally, we have these new spaces that we could think of as virtual scenes. And these are people in translocal scenes who discuss popular culture online. And I think that some of the best examples of this are fan fiction websites, right? Where you have people who come together as communities to write fan fiction about any given um, popular cultural content out there and they create even more fiction about it. And where I think this really got started was with Star Wars. Star Wars created those first three episodes, uh, four, five, and six, right? Mm -hmm. They started in the 70s. And it wasn't until I think 1999 that episode one came out so it was over 20 years between the first episode, or uh, you know, episode four, and the prequels launch. Now, in the meantime, people, and this predates the virtual translocal, right? Uh, the virtual scenes weren't even really around at that point, but people started writing their own stories into the Star Wars universe. And when um, George Lucas started making episode one, he communicated back to those fictions that were being read and brought them in, co-opted them into, back into the mainstream. And so right now there's this interesting dynamic as the Star Wars world um, grows, now they keep producing more and more content based on those fan fictions. And fan fictions keep popping up based around the new Star Wars content that's made. So now there's just all this content out there 
that Disney gets to profit from, which is the sad reality of it. With collective consumption, there are also social organizations that are formed to allow this to happen. And so these social organizations are where subcultures and scenes become or, uh, formalized. So it goes from something that's resistant, out there, people start coming together and creating organizations, and then it becomes something real. So here, um, one of the, the things that he talks about are gaming organizations. Um, and people in these organizations start staging events. Um, so Grazian discusses how gaming organizations like Scrabble end up creating tournaments. And I found a picture of a Scrabble tournament here. And it's quite the collective of, of people. It's mainly elderly people in this uh, image, but they're young people. They're uh, people of diverse ethnicities in this picture, all coming together to play Scrabble at what looks like a retirement home or something. I mean, this doesn't look like the hippest place to go hang out, right? Almost like a bingo hall. Um, I mean, maybe it's at the local Y, I don't know. But it's a fascinating um, thing. People become part of them. The other big thing here is uh, events like Comic-Con. And of course, the big Comic-Con is one thing, but there's lots of other cons that happen around that are more specific. Comic-Con is huge. Um, I had a, a graduate student who uh, did an ethnography of two different cons in the DFW area. She was really interested in the way um, different manga, I'm, is it manga or ma ma manga. Manga. manga? Manga, there we go. It's not my area, I'm sorry. Versus anime. And what these different conferences look like, the way sometimes they're combined, sometimes they're divided. Um, so there's a lot of different organizations for people who um, like different types of popular culture, whether it is anime or comic books or um, Marvel movies or Star Wars galaxy stuff. Um, it gives them opportunities to come together, find people who are interested in similar things. Even I mentioned K-pop earlier. K-pop concerts in the United States are their own cultural events where makeup gets sold and all this different stuff that you is far beyond what a typical concert in the American sense um, brings along with it. So these organizations develop and people become part of them. This is where we get into influencers and creators. And at the end of the day, Grazian raises the question, at what point is the interaction approach, especially when it's about viral content, is it really just about stealth marketing? And he says stealth marketing is when it's something makes something seem word of mouth, but it's driven by marketers. So often the way it ends up working for influencers on the internet is for whatever reason, somebody might become viral and they become an influencer. And at the point when they become an influencer, brands start reaching out to them and asking them to make posts about their brands. And while it might feel genuine that somebody's excited about a product, it's driven by they're getting free stuff in the mail at first and later, depending on a number of subscribers and views and likes they have for any particular content, 
will drive up more revenue being paid to them. Um, there was a great TV show that only lasted, I think, one season. It may have been two seasons. I loved it. The World According to Jeff Goldblum. Did anybody see this? No. Me and my son watched it. It went from... He would do different things. Like I think the first episode was about sneakers. And he basically goes on a deep dive. Jeff Goldblum being the dude um, from Jurassic Park uh, who's like the mathematician. Y'all know who I'm talking about with Jeff Goldblum there. More recently... Uh, the Netflix series that got canceled, Chaos. Jeff Goldblum plays Zeus. Um, but anyway, he's he's got a particular kind of character that he plays, and he's kind of that in real life. And he does this show. See, Sneakers, he went on a deep dive, but then they end up doing, he ends up meeting with a person that does unboxing of sneakers. Well, anybody is doing an unboxing video, although I've done some. If you go to my YouTube page to watch the um, uh, lectures, you can also see me doing terrible unboxing videos of books for the Ben Agar Theory Library that I run here on campus. But I'm like, oh. Look at this book. And I mispronounce people's names. It's pretty awful. And there was no paid content in that. I bought those books and was just trying to drive interest in the Ben Agar Theory Library, but whatever. Unboxing videos or videos where people go and they eat food or from a certain place. Most of them are getting kickbacks from those places. So if you're like, oh, I love McDonald's. McDonald's is um, paying for that most of the time. And for the people out there, McDonald's has not paid for this. And I would never take McDonald's. I hate McDonald's. It's trash. Yeah. Finally. Everybody My son loves it. But this is the seductive part of McDonald's, right? Like, the whole idea of McDonald's, they build that brand affinity from a young age by giving the best toys and colorful Happy Meals in a box, right? And then they're like, I want to go to McDonald's. Well, what's so great about it? And the playground, too. Not all McDonald's have playgrounds, but a, a many do. So, stealth marketing. There's also the idea of reality marketing. And this is the idea that marketers recruit market mavens, early adopters, and opinion leaders to chat up their networks about a product. So there's an effort to find these people who are kind of organically known to be uh, early adopters, market mavens, so that they can then produce the goods. But in the end, the interaction approach ignores that word of mouth is often an intentional form of marketing. Marketers are very smart and they want to get their products out in front of people. And one of the best ways to do that is through popular culture. But when things seem too heavy handed and we know we're being marketed to, some, many people shy away from that thing. So what they try to do is they try to make it feel as bottom up as possible. And there was a great documentary, I used to watch it, now it's getting old at this point. But a frontline PBS documentary, I highly recommend it. It's called Generation Like. And Generation Like was like the second um, 
in a could you could think of it as a series uh, that this one filmmaker did. I, now I can't think of the first one. Um, but it was all kind of about like the MTV generation and the way marketing worked on MTV is this completely artificial thing. But at the end of the day, it's the first one's real creepy because the marketers would show up and people like go to teenagers' houses and be like, "Show me the clothes that you like. Like, what do you think is real cool?" And because they were try, they try to get out in front of trends. Because it's hard to manufacture that viral trend, right? They try to figure out, well, who are the market mavens, the early adopters? Because let's see what they're wearing. Because other people copy what they wear. So if we can figure out what they're wearing, then we can market it and we can use them as our marketers to go out there and sell these clothes or sell these goods. And all the internet's really done in social media is put that turbo charge. So instead of just thinking, okay, let's go out and find this person, well, they can look at social media um, data, big data on social media, and say, well, who's the most liked unknown person, right? And then they go and they try to find those people and they try to use them to get to their followers. And in turn, they also begin promoting those people to make them even bigger. I'll see y'all Tuesday.